Welcome to Ultimate Wildlife Gardens. My name is Chris Caligari. This video is about introducing wild plants into your garden. Minimal cost, very reliably and very straightforwardly. It's 100% reliable. Now, if I say that I'm going to introduce lots of plants into the garden, you might have an image like this, the backdrop I've got behind me. Or perhaps even like this. Hi, now this is the classic kind of beautiful garden. But this channel isn't about that. This is about helping wildlife and therefore the, our take on this is rather different. Some years ago, as a garden designer, uh, I visited a house with a backdrop. In fact, I've got a photograph of it like this. This garden was owned by Lady, or oh, better change the name, we'll call her Lady Garden. And she was very proud of her garden. A beautiful, beautiful old lady, as kind, as kind as you like. Uh, very fond of wildlife and how she used to lament the disappearance of wildlife, the declining wildlife in her garden. At the time I was a bit of a Jack the Lad garden, television garden designer and I had to confront her with some f sad truths and the truth was that she was part of the problem. She produced a very beautiful garden with the aid of garden designers in the past but unfortunately that sort of garden, this sort of garden which I've got behind me is really nice for humans and it is very pretty but alas it is not good for wildlife. It's good for a feeding station for a very limited range of species, pollinators, uh, nectar feeders, which are important of course, but that's only a tiny, tiny snippet sample of wildlife which should be present in our gardens and which is missing. And all the other species that our gardens, our, our countryside is lacking, depend on those other species the ones that aren't so conspicuous. So the sorts of spaces that we want to create are more like this. So perhaps I'm saying that our lady gardens of this world ought to be a little bit wilder, a little bit more natural. Now, in case you think I've lost the plot, I haven't. I know we're talking about introducing plants into the garden and the best ways to do it. But let's just first of all take a look at this area behind in a little bit more detail. Let's not underestimate it. Yes. This is a piece of vegetation which is really just let go. Um, it's made up largely of a nettle bed but you can see that there's an awful lot of vegetation which is dead this is early spring when this is recorded and this is an ideal place for small mammals, amphibians, beetles, mollusks, butters and butterflies and moths and they'll overwinter in this vegetation, vitally important. There's also the odd flower, we've got a dead nettle there um, and these young nettles of course in early spring are exactly what our small tortoise shells, our peacock butterflies will be looking for to lay their eggs. There's another spot here which is under the shade of a hazel tree. There's quite a bit of cow parsley growing. I won't be treating it like a garden. I won't be digging it. I won't be digging things out. Um, so things like the cow parsley, well not very much is going to compete with that successfully. But when you move further under the shade of the, uh, of the hazel tree, as it is here, um, then the cow parsley is not so well suited for that. And so this, perhaps, where the celandines are here, this will possibly be a good place for 
growing things like primroses, violets, uh, foxgloves. Often these plants, they'll tolerate the shade. They don't particularly like it necessarily, but they won't be outcompeted by other plants. They're better able to deal with the shade. This is an excellent piece of grassland. Not too coarse, um, just an area which isn't mowed. Superb for things like uh, skipper butterflies, marbled white, small mammal, vast amounts of living things, anthills in here. I wouldn't contemplate interfering with it at all. If I want to introduce any wildflowers, I'd simply do it through planting plants from plugs. I sent off for um, some plugs from a reputable uh, supplier. They're British stock so wherever you live and of course I've got subscribers in various parts of the world if you can get stock which is belongs in the, your country of, of origin that is essential and you can either buy the seeds or buy the young plants as plugs and this is where we go from here here are some which uh, I've purchased myself um, this is a tray which contains primroses and uh, cowslips, excellent little plants, and this is how they come if they're from a good supplier. At the moment I'm just potting up these primroses, marvellous plugs, excellent value. I push the plugs up with a pencil underneath very well developed root system ready for putting into bigger pots. The idea is that I don't want to plant them out at this stage because I want to increase the chances of them growing into uh, substantial little plants and of course although I want these plants to do well and to thrive the main purpose really is to achieve some breeding colonies. So make sure I press the compost in well all round. We don't want gaps, air gaps. We want them to give them the best chance that we possibly can. And then the obligatory tap just to settle the soil in, the compost. Of course, uh, peat free compost and those then I'll put in my seed tray take them outside give them a good water uh, the watering is partly to give them a drink but most important essential is that it settles the compost in to make intimate contact with the roots uh, they stand the best chance of going out to uh, provide uh, excellent little plants which will breathe the breeding stock and allow them to spread naturally in situations where I think they will thrive. I don't want a garden as such. I want to find positions where we would naturally expect them to occur. A few weeks have passed now and the plants have established, my uh, primroses and cowslips have established in a nice strong little plants. I'm not going to go down that line again about why we do that. Um, but this channel, of course, has a, an approach which is rather different to most other wildlife garden channels in that we are very much ecologically based. And for establishing these plants, we're, move, we're, we're not really using uh, horticultural principles, but instead ecological principles. There is a bit of an overlap between the two. So if we're considering primroses, no, we'll start with cowslips. If we're putting the cowslips out, we need to think about what sort of habitat is going to suit cowslips. And generally speaking, um, they're going to be found in areas where there's not too much competition from vigorous grasses, coarse grasses, broadleaf plants. They just won't compete with it. Now, traditionally, we might expect to find them in a hay meadow. Uh, an old established hay meadow often has cowslips in it. Now we're going to reproduce that and use the same principles. So if we take an area like for example a lawn, um, 
that is going to have been mowed for several years, perhaps many years, and mowing stops uh, broadleaf plants from establishing. I'm thinking particularly things like nettles, thistles, docks. In general, you won't find those in closely mowed, in areas that have been regularly mowed. They won't withstand that mowing. And each time we mow, if we take the cutting uh, uh, the cuttings away, then of course the nutrients which have been taken up by the plants, we're going to be taking those away. In a hay meadow, same principle. A field is cut every year, the nutrients have gone up into the plants, the plant material is taken away for animal feed or whatever, and so gradually the nutrient status in the soil goes down, and that doesn't suit all those vigorous plants which would crowd out the cowslips. Now in my own garden at the front I have an area which for the last couple of years I've been mowing. Not good soil um, but it's not a suitable place at the front of the house. Uh, I don't want to be too traditional but it's not really going to suit say a nettle bed or an area of a bramble or overgrown, not too overgrown anyway. So the last couple of years it's been mowed and all the broadleaved or virtually all the broadleaf plants and the coarse grasses have disappeared and that's where I'm going to plant my cowslips. There they stand every chance of succeeding and growing away. I'm planting the cowslips in dotted around, not too uniformly, that looks a bit awful. Um, but generally grouping them in perhaps threes or fives in areas of the little bit of grassland that I think they're going to, going to uh, grow well and get established. Uh, now I said I'm not going to go down that line again of what, how we do it, but really if I can just get those plants to set seed, they'll produce stacks of seed and we'll let the process occur naturally. The seed will find its, find its way to places that are suitable. Uh, the seeds of primroses and cowslips have a vernalisation requirement, so it's great if the seed just sits in the ground, has some periods of cold going through winter, and next year I have every confidence I'll have a profusion of plants growing in there. The cowslips have been planted in. I'll give them a little water just to settle them in hope for good growing conditions but I'll pamper them a little bit during this the first season. It's the only time I will need to just to make sure they grow away and produce lots of seeds. Future management, well I'll keep up the same sort of management as would have been uh, practiced in a, an old hay meadow. Hay meadows we think of full of flowers um, and I'll probably introduce other plants as well, uh, all sorts of hay meadow plants, but the management will be the same whether I've just got cowslips or I've got an abundance of other wildflowers. I might even scatter a little bit of wildflower seed uh, just to help the process along. So the management from here on will be to leave this grassland alone during the growing season uh, until well, what would be the sort of time when you would be haymaking? Uh, so, about let's for me, it's not before the end of July. I'll give it a cut. Now, that's when hay would have been taken off. Now, my uh, modern take on that on my small wildlife area will be to strim it. So, I'll strim it probably about August time, when the seed has been set of all the wildflowers that might occur there. Ideally, as per haymaking, I'll let the vegetation die off, uh, dry out, let everything, let the seed settle out of what I've cut, and then I'll rake that off. Okay, it would be baling, hay collecting. Um, and I'll take that away, and that of course is another excellent potential bit of habitat. I'll take those 
that dry grass, dry plant material, and somewhere a little bit away from this site, I'll pile it up and let it naturally compost down. Now that's great because it means we don't, we're not having a fire, uh, and it creates another habitat, a very valuable habitat, for all sorts of other wildlife. This heap will compost, will produce heat somewhere that perhaps slow worms, grass snakes, small mammals, maybe even newts will overwinter, a myriad of other creatures will be very glad of that, that hay pile. So it's a double whammy. Then, uh, once I've let it dry, I've raked it off, I've collected it, then I will turn to my mower with a box on and I'll run over it with the mower and that will collect up uh, and cut off tidily all the vegetation, make it nice and short, uh, mow it with a box on it preferably, take the cuttings away, those of course can go onto the compost heap, uh, and leave it with a lawn-like looking impression. I might do that a couple of times depending on the season, if the grass is growing, because what I want to do is stop mowing during the winter uh, and so that when it comes into spring it's very short vegetation and the cowslips and the other hay meadow plants will be able to grow away and so the cycle goes on. I'll leave it to grow ideally right through the season until we get back to August time when it'll be time to trim it. Each year I do it conditions will get better because I'll be taking off the plant material which is grown and the nutrients with it, taking those nutrients, putting them onto my composting heap uh, and so the nutrient status of the soil will go down, the number of wild flowers will go up and so we're using a fairly natural process to produce a lovely wildflower garden. A bit of a slap on the wrist for myself there, I said wildflower garden and I, I'm always a bit loath to talk about wildflower gardening. I know the channel is about wildflower gardens, but really gardening is all about eliminating competition, about weeding, all that sort of thing. And so I really should have said, well, I'd prefer, I should have said wildflower area. I like that. I won't be putting much in the way of wildflowers in the rough bit of grass I showed you earlier on, because that is such a valuable bit of habitat. Yes, it's not full of lovely colourful flowers, it has a fair number, but I won't be planting into that because a lot of hay meadow species won't compete with the coarse grasses in there, but I don't want to do away with it because it's immensely valuable. The wildlife that gets in there is absolutely terrific. I won't be interfering when trying to plant wildflowers in my nettle beds. Nettle beds, same reason. I'll leave them alone. So we're creating this rich mosaic of habitats which is absolutely vital. Right now let's turn my attention to the primroses. Again I'll be using what I think are sound ecological principles and I'll be considering where is it that we generally find primroses? Well I'm going to generalise here but a typical place for primroses would be in a deciduous woodland, let us say, where there's enough light coming through, perhaps a woodland edge, something like that. Uh, because primroses rely largely on a lack of competition from more aggressive plants. And so therefore, when I'm thinking about planting out my primroses, I either want to find places where there's a certain amount of shade and there's not too much competition from more vigorous open plants, you know, plants of open land, um, in the example which I showed you earlier on, I'm not going to expect them to compete with things like cow parsley. It's just not going to happen. The cow parsley will overshadow them. I don't say they won't survive there, but my general principle is to look at where primroses grow naturally and so 
in, the, in this deciduous woodland, primroses start to grow very early, before the tree trees have developed a full canopy, and they'll do their growing, flowering, before the canopy is completely formed. So, for putting my primroses out, I've got a bunch of, uh, a couple in fact, of uh, hazels, which again I showed you earlier on, and the shade from those hazels is sufficient to exclude a lot of vigorous plants. That's ideal. Another place which I showed in another earlier video is where I've allowed a hedge to come out. The farmer can't reach it with this machine. On my side, I let the hazel grow out onto the uh, over the grassland and that creates an area of shade and so I'll plant primroses under the shade of that hazel hedge and that too I hope they will go away and succeed there. So this video really is showing something different from most channels because we're using the ecological principles which we hold so dear on this channel and which will always work because we're working with nature. You'll find some channels that will suggest, for example, stripping off the topsoil from an area and seeding it to get your wildflowers. I don't say it doesn't work, I don't say that those people are wrong, but for me it's not the best way of doing it. It's an awful lot of work and I find it rather difficult to cope with the concept of doing anything that drastic and that really rather destructive way of doing things. So the whole principle which I use is to either identify areas within my wildlife garden where certain plants will survive or hopefully will thrive or alternatively, which I often do, and you'll, you'll see in, this, in the examples I've used here, by creating the habitats that I want so that the plants that I want will survive. And having got those plants, and obviously the animals which depend on those plants, will also thrive. I hope that this proves useful to you. I hope that you'll find my techniques work well. Uh, I can tell you that they absolutely do. I've been doing them for many years, as my aged face will tell you. I've always been a wildlife gardener well, all my life, and these methods work well. It's less work, it's less damaging to the environment, and I will personally guarantee the results. If you've enjoyed this video, I'd be most grateful if you would click the like button, which will appear in the corner at the end of the video. I would also be most grateful if you would share it. That helps a lot. And particularly if you would subscribe to the channel. I know many of you fully endorse the message that comes from, or the messages that come with this channel. And I suppose the most useful thing you can do is to spread this way of thinking to people who will perhaps lend you an ear. And if you would point them in the direction of this channel, it would be useful to, to me. But if you can just persuade the uh, people under your influence to adopt our ecological principles, the main thing, by far the most important thing, is that wildlife will benefit and that's what both you and I are all about. If wildlife benefits that's well, so well worthwhile. It's the only reason I'm here. It's the only reason you're watching this channel. So keep up the good work. Thanks ever so much for watching. See you soon. Bye.